Welcome to ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Keisha King. In our show this time, we'll review some of our Beyond the Lines episodes, where you meet some of the incredible guests on that show. Yes. Every Monday morning, tennis star Rusty Komori is host of Beyond the Lines and showcases his famous guests week after week, people you'd love to meet. Rusty was the tennis coach at Punahou for many years and later became the tennis pro at Wailai Country Club. As a popular coach and pro, he has gotten to meet a great many people in and visiting Hawaii and it shows. He's also an author. In 2017, he wrote a book on how to achieve leadership and excellence in your life. Coincidentally or not, it's called Beyond the Lines, creating a leadership culture to achieve extraordinary results. As you will see, Rusty is a welcoming, articulate, well-prepared, and curious host. He puts his guests at ease immediately, and they respond accordingly. Rusty has lots of followers, and it's no surprise that Beyond the Lines is one of our most popular shows, often selected in our top five top-of-the-line shows. Over the past year, Rusty has appeared in more than 90 episodes of Beyond the Lines on ThinkTech. There isn't enough time to show you all of his episodes right now, or any of them in full. Over the past 90 episodes, Rusty has had some very high-profile guests, and we ought to name a few of them. These guests have included Justin Cruz, Will Sparrow, Alicia Michioka, Emma Woe, Doug Chin, Glenn Medeiros, David Ige, Chris Lee, Christine Camp, Rick Freed, Luby Gazoff, Juliet Leiter, Trevor Ozawa, Christy Yamaguchi, Augie Toba, Guy Hagi, Frank DeLima, Maya Sotoro Ng, June Jones, Devin Nakoba, Lindsey Berg, Kekoa Kakumano, Dave Shoji, Michael Bennett, Trini Kaupoiki, Henry Capono, Josh Green, Lee Donahue, and Nick Rolovich. Wow. This is just to name a few of Rusty's famous celebrity guests. If you don't know who they are, look them up on ThinkTech, YouTube, Google, or Wikipedia, and you'll see what we mean. For this OC16 show, we'll include segments from a handful of Rusty's episodes with a handful of these guests. We hope you enjoy them as much as we did. We have so much to talk about. Yes. Let's, go, <laughs> let's, let's go right into... Okay. Um, the bullying. Mm -hmm. You were bullied when you were in fifth grade? Yes. Tell me about those experiences. Well, it was, I was 10 years old, and at that time I knew that I wanted to do something to help people. I loved being around my friends, I loved being around people, my peers, my family, and I knew that I wanted to be a person that could give back. And I had a best friend at the time who was involved in pageantry, and we had been best friends since preschool. So I kind of looked up to her in a sense, and I saw that she did pageants. And I wanted to try, I wanted to follow in her footsteps because I knew that through pageantry, they help out in the community. So I asked my mom if I could enter a pageant, and at first she said no, so I was like, okay. Well, <laughs> guess I gotta wait. But then eventually she said, okay, you can do your pageant. And I was, I was so excited. I decided to tell literally everybody that I knew at my very small school that I was going to enter in this pageant. And I thought, you know, being 10 years old and just being a kid, everyone would be like, oh my God, that's so exciting. Um, but this girl who is my best friend, she told me things like, oh, well, you know, you're not pretty enough to be in a pageant. You're, you're not smart enough to be in a pageant. You're too fat. You're not going to win. And hearing those things from somebody that I look up, looked up to, who was basically one of my role models at the time, I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you could, could be like that. But I decided, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to do it because I want to. Once you left the FBI, you decided to travel for nearly a year? Yeah, yeah, as crazy as it sounds. <laughs> so um, a lot of people ask, you know, did you have 100,000 saved up? You know, you're planning to go for a year? Like how, you know, and luckily I was able to buy a, a condominium in Waikiki and I, and I rented it out and 
Yeah, so I mean, if I can share with you yeah. kind of what that looked like. Um, so the night before I printed my resignation, yeah. I had on my computer screen, I had one, I think, Microsoft Word document with my letter of resignation. And then on my little laptop computer, I had, um, I think, Expedia or some travel website uh, with a one-way ticket to Iceland. Whoa. Yeah, so I knew, and it was non-refundable. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm cheap, right? <laughs> so I knew if I booked it, um, I, and that was it, right? So. I hovered over the reserve button for a while, and then I just clicked. Wow. And then, and then I ended up printing my letter of resignation. Um, so I, the, the week following, I think I submitted it. Uh, they were very happy because they thought I was actually asking for a promotion or something like this. But um, yeah, so that's how it all started. Risk determines destiny. Risk promotes growth. Yep. What are your thoughts about risk? You gotta risk it for the biscuit. <laughs> uh, you know, I think for me, I'm a very visual person. So I think about the pendulum, right? So the pendulum swings one way and it swings equally the other way, right? So on one side of the pendulum, I consider risk. The other side, I consider reward. So if you take a little risk, your reward's obviously gonna be a little bit lower. Now, um, the higher the risk, the higher the reward. But again, that's situational. You can't apply the pendulum theory across the board. Um, for example, in terms of my financial investments, my risk is a little bit lower. My, re my reward is lower, but I leverage longevity and like Warren Buffett says, yeah. compounding interest over time. Now, as far as you know, my personal, I'm a very risky person. You know, so when I travel, I like to do things that are risky. But you know, I do photography as well, so the shots that I get might be extraordinary. You know, yeah. so um, it's really situational. So again, you can't really you know you know say this is the absolute law uh, as far as risk and reward. Um, but I would say, and if it helps you, for me, it helps me visualize the pendulum. Yeah. As far as risk and reward. Your first year coaching, you took us to a bowl game. You won that bowl game. And you took us to two bowl games in the past three years. And last season was our first winning season since 2010. What are your goals for your team this year? Kind of put, talked about phase two. Um, what is, we, we have to keep improving. I, you know, the bowl win was, was so awesome yeah. for those guys. Those guys, especially the seniors, you know, Corey Rasmussen, Leo, I mean, Marcus Kemp, these guys are, are, are at their core, great people that continue to work hard, continue to attack the process. Um, I was honored they gave belief in, in, our, in myself and the staff, and um, they didn't hesitate. and They yeah. wanted to go out as winners, and, and they deserve to. Um, you know, then just to be able to say a couple years later, all right, now we've won. We woke up. We were better in most of the games than, than you know, being 500 was great and getting a bowl win, but then now you're taking another step mentally. Um, and I probably brought up the Mountain West Championship too soon for our program. I don't know if we were ready mentally, um, but we talk about phase two, um, and, and I think it, it encompasses everybody, not just myself, um, the coaching staff, the team. I think it's equipment, training, administration, uh, fundraising, everybody. Now let's see what we can really build this to. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it get to such great heights, whether it's the Holiday Bowl, whether it's the Sugar Bowl. Um, and, and just having some of the alumni come back and inject that pride back into our student-athletes. Um, there's, there's a very high belief in not only what we're trying to do, but how we try to do it as far as engaging the community, especially the young kids and, and being role models. And I can't thank our team enough um, for just taking on that challenge to, and realizing that, yes, I can, I can make a lot of things better by doing something good today. You yeah. know? And, and for me, it was, with, with Hawaii, it's always give first, you know, and, and then things will come after. I don't think it's come, take, 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 take. I don't yeah. think this doesn't work.
I want to know, Naomi, how do you define success? There's a lot going through my brain right now. <laughs> yeah. Success to me is really getting out of your comfort zone and really knowing as you do that who you truly are and being vulnerable, being open, not this persona of who I am and what I do. What really matters? What can I share with you? Can we have a real conversation as business owners? And so for me, success is being vulnerable and truly knowing who you are. And once you know that, you know what you can do and how you can become even better. And especially for people in this world. I like that. Be real and yeah. speak the truth. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> now, what do you feel is the best advice, most valuable mm. advice you've ever received in your life? I know that instantaneously. So my father, when I worked for him, um, when I was 20, 21, 22, he called me into his office and he's a physical therapist. Yeah. And he was um, going through some checks and one of the insurance companies had paid him $5 more. And he said to me, hey, darling, I just want you to know that this insurance company paid me $5 more and I want to take the time and send it back to them. And he said, know this, what does it profit a man to own the whole world but to lose his soul? It doesn't matter if it's one penny or it's $50. What matters is you do the right thing. And that is, you know, that's huge to me. Everything we do, we need to look and say, are we doing the right thing? Does it feel right? Is it right? And that's, that's, yeah, that's always stuck with me. It's all about integrity and ethics. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, which is a big discussion today. Yeah. Chief, in my book, Beyond the Lines, a, a big part of it is about leadership. And, I mean, you're an extraordinary leader. What do you feel the best leaders do? What are the qualities of the best leaders, in your opinion? <laughs> that they listen to their people ah. and uh, find out what their needs are yeah. and their wants. I mean, it's good to know what they want also. Yeah. But there is a definite uh, separation between the two. And trying to, try to satisfy their needs and do it on a daily basis, uh, that, that's, that's to me the most important part of a leader. And making it known how you're trying to, to uh, <clears throat> get, get their needs met. Because it's important to them. Because I know that what we, when we did surveys, the farther you go away from your core unit, like if you're in a sector, the farther you go away, the less tr trust you have of those above you. Yeah. And it's just, it's just something that goes with any organization. So knowing that, you have to be able to come down and, and, and provide, provide what they need. I think you have to be able to listen to them. You should never, I'll give you an um, example. I, I had this, I was on the way to a meeting and I was walking through the hallways and it was, I was going to be late. But this officer stopped me in the hallway and said, Chief, can I ask you a question? And I could have told him, I'm not down, I, I'm late for a meeting, but yeah. it was important for him to ask me. So I said, sure, ask me the question. And, you know, I answered his question, uh, and at least it satisfied his need at that time. Yeah. You know? But you have to do that as a leader. You have to, you, you know, you can't stop that. Yeah, and empathy is huge, I mm. mean, with your team and mm. building trust, like you said, and mm. respect and loyalty. How did you first get involved in tennis? Well, I grew up around tennis. My dad was a club pro. Um, but I didn't play tennis to begin with. I actually played soccer, baseball, basketball, and then eventually gravitated towards tennis. But I think that's part of the reason why I ended up liking it so much was because I chose it. I wasn't forced into it. So your, was your dad a coach in tennis? He was. He was the club pro at, at Hillcrest Country Club, the head pro. Um, like I said, I grew up around it, was there all the time, actually strung some rackets before I actually got into playing. Yeah. Stringing, that's, that's a talent, too. Oh, yeah. Now, what kind of player were you? Were you always this fit? I was a chubby kid really? growing up. <laughs> um, and I, as I was playing baseball and, and some other sports, I um, 
could make contact with the ball and, and did good, but I couldn't run very well. <laughs> so that was my challenge with tennis was, you know, I, I could make contact, put the ball where I wanted to, but I couldn't move really well. <laughs> but eventually I got the hang of it, kept working hard, and, and it worked out. Well, you move very fast on the tennis court nowadays. Thank you. Yeah. Now, how, how did you end up uh, coming to Hawaii, Brent? I ended up, I played tennis at Tyler Junior College for two years. Um, we actually won the national championship there and uh, was part of a, a great team. Very fortunate to be part of that team. And from there, uh, I knew John Nelson was a new coach over in Hawaii, and, and we connected. Um, and I ended up coming out to play at UH. Under his recommendation, he was hoping that I would come, and I, and I did, um, and loved it. Yeah. Loved the experience. What's been an adversity that you dealt with in your life that you have to overcome? Um, I think for anyone that lives in Hawaii that wants to stay in Hawaii, I think a general adversity that we all face is the, just the ability to live here. Yeah. Um, if you can find a way uh, you know, to put food on the table and to pay your bills and not have to move away to do it, um, I consider you successful. Um, and it's, it's very hard to do that here. Um, and I've, I've always wanted, in my mind, I thought success was just being able to stay here, you know, where my family is, and to, to just to be able to continue to live in, in such an amazing place with just amazing people. It's very difficult. And that's, that's a common um, adversity that everyone that lives here faces. Oh, I like hearing that perspective. And let's talk about Krista Whitmire. She's someone that goes beyond the lines. And for the viewers that don't know, I mean, she was a hugely popular radio DJ here in Hawaii. She's one of your best friends. And she passed away a few months ago uh, because of cancer. How did you and Krista meet? Uh, ironically, Maleko introduced us. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was doing a party. I did a party called Skyline at the Hanohana Room. Yep. And uh, this was before it became this, you know, giant beast of an event that the Skyline that everyone knew. This was in the early days. It wasn't that busy. Um, Maleko brought Krista in and we, I mean, it was just like instant chemistry. And um, I think at some point we even, you know, houdini on Maleko and, and her and I ended up at the wave and, you know, we're partying till four in the morning. The first night we meet, we're just, we just had such an instant connection. We have a very kind of uh, similar personality, s similar energy level, similar optimistic outlook on life. Like there was just a lot of similarities uh, between us and we just really clicked. Yeah. Um, and really from that day forward, you know, we were best friends. Yeah. One of the biggest concepts, too, of our team was to welcome adversity and mm -hmm. to look forward to challenges. What are your thoughts about that? Nobody likes adversity. I mean, in the ideal world, everyone would just like to cruise through life without any challenges. But, I mean, it's, I've learned a lot about that recently. Or recently with the new job and recently just in life in general. I mean, everyone goes through their challenges. It's how you kind of you know, you grow from it. I think your show with June Jones, yep. he was talking about the car crash and, you know, how he had to mentally fight mind over matter to get his, like, legs back working and everything. So I think adversity should be cherished because you're going to come out stronger, um, mentally stronger, if anything. And it's, it's something that I'm still learning to this day. You know, there's... It's a restaurant. Something's broken right now. <laughs> Something is broken. But it's just like how we fix it and how we move forward. And I think that part was trained early. You know, I lost a lot of singles matches. I lost doubles matches. Um, but it's just how you move forward on from that. Yeah, and you learned a lot from that. And exactly. I, I like what you said about the challenges because, you know, I would tell you guys that when we would look forward to adversity, and we, we didn't know when it was going to happen, but it was going to happen. And oh, once yeah. we got through it and we dealt with it, we would become stronger for yep. that experience. We'd become better. We'd become smarter for that. Because you say to yourself, I, oh, I've, done, I've gone through that already. That's fine. I, I know you have the confidence to overcome that hurdle if it ever comes up again. So then yeah. you look, what's the next hurdle coming up? Yeah. yeah. It's a mindset. Exactly. Yeah. And Chris, what do you feel the best coaches or the best leaders do? I think leadership, just in general, defining the term leadership for me is growing a culture 
that everyone wants to be a part of. And I think like you did that at Punahou. Um, some of my bosses on the mainland did that. Like I enjoyed going to work. I enjoyed going to practice, even though it was work or practice. You know, um, it's creating that culture that you know, I want to fight for you. Rusty is live on thinktechhawaii.com, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter every Monday at 10 a.m. And we upload all his shows to YouTube and iTunes so you can see and hear them later. We hope you'll look at at least some of Rusty's shows. If you want to know more about him, see his website, rustykomori.com. If you want to get his book, Beyond the Lines, it's on amazon.com. Including Beyond the Lines, Think Tech produces more than 30 talk shows in our downtown studio. Our shows are very diverse, covering things you might never have otherwise known. You can always find these links to our shows in our daily email advisories. If you don't already get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, Call 808-374-2014. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us.
We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of Think Tech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Okay, Keisha, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Keisha does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation, excellence, and leadership wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Keisha King. Aloha, everyone.